Good afternoon, everyone. Before I talk about the economy, I wanted to acknowledge the concerning report out of Washington that the Supreme Court may overturn Roe v. Wade. If true, this would be an enormous step backwards and damage civil rights. But as I said in my statement this morning, Vermont has prepared for this possibility. A few years ago, we passed a law affirming that reproductive health decisions are between a patient and their doctor without government interference. In November, Vermonters will have the ability to codify that right in our state constitution when Prop 5 is on the ballot. So at the end of the day, the fundamental rights and liberties of all women will be defended, protected, and preserved here in Vermont. Next, at last week's press conference, we discussed the serious demographic challenges we face as a state and how that impacts the workforce, our schools, and our economy. As we talked about, in the last 20 years, the number of Vermonters over the age of 65 has increased by over 40,000. Meanwhile, those between the ages of 35 and 65, the heart of our workforce, declined by over 40,000. What that means is the tax burden, which is one of the highest in the nation, is being placed on more people living on fixed incomes. And there aren't enough kids in the wings to fill the gap. From 2000 to 2022, Vermont lost about 30,000 people under the age of 18. These trends are having a devastating effect on our communities. More than half of our municipalities have seen their grand list, which is the total value of their taxable property, stay the same or shrink. This has happened while their budgets and school spending has increased, meaning the burden is tougher on the taxpayers still left standing. The bottom line is we need more people and we're competing with the rest of the country for them, which is why I included relocation and workforce recruitment in my budget, and I hope it gets across the finish line. It's also why it's critical we invest in these communities, typically the rural areas of our state, which were once the foundation of our economy. In order to reverse these trends, we need to support community revitalization. Make it easier to do business or expand, not harder. Provide the infrastructure to support people like water, sewer, stormwater, and broadband, while also, also offering smart tax relief and building out and improving housing stock for workers who are here and for those we're trying to attract. That's why I've been so focused on increased funding for economic development and community revitalization in the budget and why it's a line in the sand for me. If we're going to reverse these trends that have plagued us for decades, we simply can't let this once in a lifetime opportunity slip through our fingers. My team and I will continue to make our case to members of the legislature in the final days of the session because many Vermont communities are counting on us to spend and invest this money wisely. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Curley, who will go into further details. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. As the legislature works towards adjournment, we are grateful that important community recovery and revitalization programs, which were first announced in the governor's budget address in January, continue to be actively discussed and worked on. Throughout the session, there have been robust conversations about how to best support Vermonters and the communities as we recover from the pandemic. The administration and ACCD have worked with legislators to adjust our original proposals. This includes adopting some of the, their ideas and feedback to meet our shared goals of better targeting areas of need. The programs we're seeking to fund will allow municipalities, 
nonprofits, and small businesses to make the, re the recoveries and investments that they otherwise would not be able to make. Think about the child care center looking to expand. The infrastructure proje project a town doesn't have the resources to finance or the arts organization looking to rebuild their business after two years of being closed. Many of these types of projects are near ready to implement. They just need the extra funding to make it a reality. We have worked with the input of stakeholders around the state to create a framework for a new community recovery and revitalization program that is so needed in many communities around our state but it needs to be funded at the appropriate level. The governor's budget pr proposal called for $100 million in economic development money. And as we wade through the final days of the session, we're asking that budget committees restore the majority of that ask. Grants made through this targeted program will be vetted to ensure they will help repair a harm that COVID created, will grow a town's tax base, and will enhance an opportunity for all in a region. Projects will bring new jobs, provide services, and make critical investments in infrastructure that will spur growth. We have very few communities and businesses who can utilize the few economic development tools that we do have, and this program will help bring these priority projects over the finish line. So we have a framework that includes most of our original proposals wrapped into one economic development program, and we're grateful for the work that's been done with the legislature to get us to this point. But without appropriate funding, the targeted recovery and growth we are seeking will fall flat. We will miss an opportunity to help our communities, our small businesses, get important recovery projects over the finish line We'll miss the opportunity to increase the tax base in towns around the state, especially in the rural areas. And we will miss the opportunity to make our communities more vibrant, more affordable, and more desirable as a place to live and do business. We hope the legislature will work to fund this once in a generation opportunity for our state, rather than letting it pass us by. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. We continue to watch data trends around the BA2 variant closely. Unfortunately, this current wave of cases is not yet going down in Vermont, but COVID-19 activity remains magnitudes lower than what we saw during the initial Omicron surge. We are fortunate that the vast majority of Vermonters are protected from the most serious effects of COVID-19 through vaccination, and that illness from this version of the virus is typically milder for most. However, we know BA2 is much more transmissible than the original Omicron strain. And with our changing behaviors around COVID-19, and because we continue to be a state with perhaps still the lowest rate of immunity from having had COVID, we do expect the virus to continue to spread. How much it spreads and its impact will change over time as we've seen with variants over the past two years. That is why at this stage of the pandemic, we need to continue to assess our own personal risk for COVID-19 to decide whether to wear a mask or what other precautions we may choose to protect ourselves and others. We've talked about those at higher risk due to age or health conditions, or those who are too young to be vaccinated yet. But another factor to consider is COVID-19 activity where you are. We know cases are higher in Vermont right now. But our seven-day average of percent of staffed inpatient beds in use by COVID-19 patients is actually low at 4%. But our new COVID-19 admissions per 100,000 population have increased to a higher level. So it's even more important to re-examine your risk under current circumstances and give serious considerations to taking what we know are effective prevention steps, 
like wearing a high quality mask in indoor public spaces and getting tested if you have any symptoms. When it comes to this changing virus, we can be flexible using the tools we have to reduce spread more often when we need to and then dialing them back when conditions allow. So I again encourage Vermonters to consider this based on their personal risk as this current wave continues. I also need to emphasize again making sure you are up to date on COVID vaccines, meaning you have at least gotten your first booster shot, especially if you're an older Vermonter. A recent snapshot, snapshot from UVM Medical Center showed that a majority of people who were hospitalized because of COVID-related illness were over 65 and were vaccinated, but they had not gotten even their first booster. I'll say this once again, loud and clear. It is the booster that will keep you out of the hospital. And if you are over 65 or have another reason why you are at higher risk of getting COVID, please contact your provider if you test positive so you can discuss treatment. We received great news that the federal government has actually honored our request that Vermont receive 2,000 doses of Paxlovid this week. That is a huge increase over the average of 200 per week we had previously been receiving. And these doses all arrived yesterday. This means that this effective antiviral drug will be easier for patients to access and will prevent more potential cases of severe disease in Vermont. But for those of you who diagnose yourself at home with an at-home rapid test, this benefit can only come by contacting your clinician. So do make that phone call to your doctor's office within the first five days of illness. Finally, on a separate topic, one that's been in the news though, the state working with the US Department of Agriculture has identified the presence of highly pathogenic avian influenza, H5N1, here in Vermont, both in a backyard flock and in wild birds. Now these viruses have been found in many other states as well, including neighboring states in the Northeast. The Department of Health is working closely with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife to monitor and investigate reports of what is commonly called HPAI. The Health Department is monitoring Vermonters exposed to the infected birds, including people wearing recommended PPE, for signs and symptoms of influenza starting after their first exposure and for 10 days after their last. HPAI is not a new virus, and while its spread is a concern, the public health risk is low. Just to provide some perspective, at this time, more than 2,500 people in the United States who've had exposure to birds or poultry infected with H5N1 have been or are being monitored for symptoms. And reassuringly, only one possible human case has been found to date in the United States. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor Scott, how does your party feel about uh, the Supreme Court potentially overturning Roe v. Wade? Have you heard anything from members of your own party? I have not. No. I, I mean, it happened. I was surprised to hear uh, about this last night. Um, I haven't really had an opportunity to talk with anyone else other than my staff and team this morning. So I know how I personally feel, and um, I say that in the, uh, in the message and as well as in my um, prior comments. So I think uh, this, if, if this holds true, would be devastating uh, for our 
rights here in the country and um, I think it would have a ripple effect across all areas of, uh, of our civil rights. What do you think it would mean for the Republican Party heading into the midterm elections? I, I have no idea. Um, again, we're still waiting to hear how this happened, when this happened, getting some of the facts and so forth, and I look forward to hearing more about it. Um, but again, I know how I feel about this, and um, that's why I put out the statement this morning. What do uh, you say? Would it could have a devastating impact on other civil rights? What, what are you thinking of there? Well, I think what, what it does is creates uh, mistrust in government in some respects. Like, what's next? Like, if they take this away, what's what's going to be? What's the next right uh, that someone is going to take away, whether it's LGBTQ or the right to marry um, and so forth? So I think uh, that's a legitimate concern when we see a fundamental right taken away. Governor, yesterday you vetoed a bill, Senate Bill 286, which dealt with, you know, post-employment benefits. I guess if you can explain, like, you know, what your rationale was um, with that veto. Well, again, it was probably more about principle than practicality. Uh, the, the reality is um, this, uh, my veto, will be overridden. I acknowledge that. Uh, uh, I, um, but I felt strongly about providing for um, more choice as well as risk sharing uh, in the plan. We had an opportunity to accomplish that, and I believe that in five, six, seven years, we'll be back to where we are today because it's not sustainable. Governor, I had a couple of questions about COVID for <clears throat> maybe yourself and Dr. Levine as well. It looks like um, there's uh, it, at least 12 outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Um, I'm wondering if you can shed some light on why we're seeing them, what impact that can potentially have, and also the, um, the doses of Paxlovid, where those specifically are, are going. To yeah, it's probably better questions for Dr. Levine, but, um, but we do know uh, this uh, variant is more transmissible than others, but it's milder, milder symptoms. Um, but, the, but having Paxlovid and having the quantity uh, distributed to the state is going to be a game changer for us in trying to prevent those uh, from that are um, compromised and from with health uh, issues uh, that this will keep them out of the hospital and prevent uh, further impact at Levine. You know this dovetails well with my talk about assessing your own risk and who should be thinking about masking etc. The 12 outbreaks you mentioned in long-term care facilities again those are our most vulnerable population and they have, by and large, been highly vaccinated. So what we are seeing is cases in those institutions and concerns about spread within, but again, not large numbers going into the hospital. Um, and if you uh, look at the number of deaths out of those 12 outbreaks, and we're talking two to 300 cases of very few deaths in that, in that large group of very vulnerable citizens. So that's kind of what happens when you get a variant that is so highly transmissible and a vaccine that is doing everything it is supposed to do, protect you from hospitalization and serious outcomes, but not guaranteed to protect you from becoming a positive test or a mildly symptomatic person. So if I hear you correctly, we're still seeing higher cases every day and we're seeing hospitalizations tick up, we are starting to see this, this unlinking, if you will, between cases and hospitalization. Yes, the decoupling, as it's called, for sure. And I, you know, I don't want to provide uh, optimism that's unwarranted, but looking at numbers in the last you know, five to seven days and looking at not just case numbers, but looking at the wastewater data and everything else, perhaps we've kind of leveled off and maybe begin to go on a downswing. One would think with a variant this transmissible that in other countries of the world literally raced through the population that we've perhaps had enough and it will start to uh, turn downward. 
Dr. Levine, I was intrigued by the comments you made a couple of minutes ago about uh, something to the effect of because Vermont had, it, it would seem to say to me that because Vermont was so successful at first in keeping people from being infected that the population itself might not have the protection of other places. And do you think that's uh, helping drive Vermont's high numbers now? I, I really do. It's, it's multifactorial, but I think that's one. Uh, we get data from the CDC periodically on serologic testing, which is testing people's blood for antibodies. And they can differentiate antibodies to the vaccine versus antibodies that you got because you were infected. And the nation has well over 60 plus percent people with antibodies across the board. And the highest state had something in the 70 to 72 percent range. Vermont was the lowest state with 29 percent. So that's one indicator uh, which tells us a lot. We also know from the national news looking across the country that our, in our youth, about three quarters have shown infection since the Omicron uh, part of the pandemic began. And in adults, it's about 60%. So I think Vermont has been below that because of our early success, as you said. Do you think that's something that, uh, that goes against our early success? If, if, God forbid, we were ever to be in this situation again, would you let it go faster? Go through the population? Oh, God, faster? no. No, I would never take that away. Uh, especially because we had that early success before there was even a hint of a vaccine that would ever be available. So we were really focused on saving lives and keeping people as well as possible during that time. Now with vaccine, it's been a, which has been a game changer nonetheless, uh, the fact of the matter is you still want to be protected as much as possible. And that's why we hope that new vaccines that possibly could be available in the fall will have a little more breadth of the protectiveness that they could have. And all these other new variants, I know there's BA2 and BA2.12.2. Yes. I mean, all these other ones that I can't even begin to remember the name. So do those, are, do those, how much do those concern you? Yeah, well, every variant concerns us to some degree. So we're in BA2 now. Uh, but we have a subcomponent, it's a subvariant, which is BA2121. That one is what's overtaking the Finger Lakes and all of central New York. Um, it has spilled over into Vermont to some degree. Um, the, the, the genome sequencing data we have is always a couple weeks old because genome sequencing isn't like a PCR test where you get the result the same day. It takes a couple weeks. So, the most recent rendition of that, it was still below 10 percent, but that's still a bunch of BA212 in Vermont. Uh, so we would expect that will have increased a little bit. But again, if you're immune to Omicron, the likelihood of getting one of the subvariants of Omicron is still very, very low. Um, it, your immunity is going to be across that whole spectrum. There are other parts of the world that are now seeing other variants, again, of Omicron, including in South Africa now. So the whole scientific community is very uh, cautiously watching any data that comes out of there. Do you think it would be helpful if the monitors kind of adjusted their mental approach to COVID in that, as you were saying, if you're fully vaccinated and you've had a booster and if you do get it, it's going to probably be mild that folks should just be thinking, hey, I'm probably going to get it sometime, and if I'm fully vaccinated, hopefully it won't be so bad? That is one way to think. Uh, but again, you need to look at your own risk and look at your age, look at your underlying medical conditions if you have any, look at who you're living with and who may be vulnerable that you wouldn't want to bring the virus home to. A lot of factors in play. Um, Several months ago, Dr. Fauci basically said it's not a matter if, it's a matter of when you will get the virus. Uh, the new coordinator, I'm, I'm not sure what Dr. Jha's title is in the White House, but Dr. Jha basically said something very similar, said, you know, we can't guarantee that no one in the country is going to get infected. People are going to get infected. That's not even a policy goal to prevent infection in people. 
because again, this virus has mutated to the point where it's not quite like the measles, but it's approaching uh, measles level of contagion. And when you get to a virus like that, unless you sequester yourself in your house and never leave and never come in contact with another human being, um, which is a challenging way to live your life, uh, it's going to be hard for you to avoid it, though you can still practice some good practices like wearing a mask indoors when things are really active out there. Dr. Mark Levine, I know you were saying before that you guys received some packs of uh, Paxlovin, you know, the antiviral um, pill. I guess for those who, you know, the community, community that might be skeptical of, you know, taking those, you know, what's your message uh, to those folks? About skeptical about wanting to take a drug for yeah. this? Yeah. So, you know, the reality is, uh, and, and this segues nicely from the question that was just asked, um, if you do get the virus, because it may seem inevitable, um, you need to know that if you've gotten the vaccine, you're very protected from the serious outcomes. And if you're a very vulnerable person, even if you have gotten the vaccine, that we have treatments that are very effective. And Paxlovid's effectiveness was astounding in all of the clinical trials. There should be very little reason to fear it because you won't be given the drug if you have a contraindication to it. And the major contraindication would be you take some medications that you can't possibly stop taking that interact with the medicine in a way that you're not allowed to take it. That's going to be a small subgroup. And that analysis will have been gone through before any doctor would have written the prescription for you. And the only other caveat is if your kidneys don't work so well. But there's now a new dose pack, which we also have in the state, tailor-made for people whose kidney function is less than normal. So I would really urge anybody who's in a higher risk group and who is tested positive to take advantage of the drug uh, if they are at high risk. Dr. Levine, just a quick clarifying question. Where did you say the, the, they were being allocated? Is it hospitals, long-term care, pharmacies? Oh, good. So, so the 2000 is actually something that is coming directly to the state. And we have a whole army of pharmacies that we've been allocating to that we will increase their allocation, but also uh, on a regional basis be able to provide more pharmacies uh, with those doses. We also supply hospital pharmacies. There is a federal pharmacy partnership program that we don't have as much uh, insight into how many doses are going where that the government is doing separately. So some of the pharmacies will actually get even more allocation. Then we also have another allocation going to our long-term care stockpile, if you will, where we're able to um, have it in one repository and as long-term care's request, we can easily uh, get it to them. So I think all sectors are being taken care of. Governor, I was wondering, when the House passed the Clean Heat Standard Bill, you had a big concern about the fact that the PUC was going to make the decision and you wanted it to come back to lawmakers and, and so that the governor would also have a voice in that process. The Senate seems to have put that amendment in the bill. Uh, given that, can you support that bill now? It doesn't do uh, quite what we hoped it would do. Um, there is a rulemaking provision that's in there uh, that is counter uh, to what we should be looking at for rulemaking. Um, it's a step in the right direction, but it needs to go a little bit further uh, before it gets my support. I really would like to see uh, the PUC take this and uh, design a plan and then come back to us and tell us what this plan looks like and how much is it going to cost before we move forward. Put it in a bill form and then we'll, we'll debate it and, and pass it on. Um, I think about other uh, situations over the last dozen years or so. Um, if we had this opportunity uh, to go back with single payer, for instance, that was rubber stamped, pretty much rubber stamped without anyone knowing what it was going to look like, how much it was going to cost. Uh, five years after that was passed, um, Governor Shumlin came to the conclusion we couldn't afford it and it was going to cost too much money. Um, so 
I would just like to see the plan. I'd like to have some of those details before signing off on that. And I think it's our obligation to do that for our constituents, for taxpayers, to, to at least see it right before our eyes, be able to read it, and be able to describe what it does. Because I'm, I'm not sure that I could describe what this does at this point in time. And I sure don't know how much it's going to cost or who it's going to impact. Isn't the bottom line of this bill, though, as addressed by the Senate Appropriations Amendment, call for this issue to come back to the legislature? Yeah, for not review? quite. I mean, there's, there's details that are missing in there. And um, it, again, it moves in the right direction, but it doesn't get us quite there. And it really does circumvent, in some respects, um, the, what I'm asking for. And I'm just asking for something very simple, is just to have it come back and bill for it and give us the details and how much it's going to cost. And then we can, we can go from there. So is this something you'll be working with along yeah, the way? Yeah, we're, we're trying to work with now. I mean, it's moved uh, out, of the, uh, out of the Senate uh, over to the, to the House, and we're continuing to work with them. Hopefully we'll come to a conclusion and agreement on that. I think this is, uh, this is important. And, uh, and for both, I mean, whether you support it or don't support it, I think it's important uh, for us to take this back in and take a look. Governor, speaking of, of all payer, excuse me, single payer, I understand AHS is um, looking for a one or a two year extension of all payer. Um, I don't know if that's gone through or been finally approved yet, but what, what are you hoping to see over the next couple of years in terms of health care reform? Yeah, I, I mean, this is a big issue. And certainly uh, with COVID, uh, this has become even more um, of an issue uh, that we are going to have to confront. Uh, healthcare costs have increased dramatically. And uh, so uh, we want to provide for um, some consistency, uh, but this isn't over. This will be uh, the next major issue that we'll be facing, uh, uh, some of them will be facing over the next few years. But, uh, but we're making some gains in terms of uh, negotiating with the federal government on the all-payer model at this point. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe you have signed into law the state code of ethics bill. How do you plan to act on that? Yeah, that's uh, that's today. I, I intend to to vote uh, or to sign that bill. Okay, and I'm, I apologize if I missed this because I was late today. But uh, how do you plan personally on voting for Prop Five? This oh, fall? I'm voting for it. Thank you. Why are you leaning towards the ethics bill? Why do you think it's needed? I'm not sure that it's needed. I mean, it's certainly in the executive branch uh, that we have uh, we have taken steps, I think, to, to protect the public. And uh, I feel good about that. But this is much broader. Um, I do uh, think that it, uh, you know, we need to give confidence to, to Vermonters that we're doing the right thing. And if this puts more guardrails on, so be it. We're going to have to take a look and make sure that we're uh, it adheres, uh, I mean, we have our own standard and our own ethics policy, and, and then we just have to conform uh, the new policy to that so it fits. But I have no concerns about uh, further ethics reform. I, I do hope that the legislature uh, takes it upon themselves to, to make sure that they're uh, doing, um, um, having an ethics policy uh, that fits them as well. Back to the Roe decision, um, of, of course, abortion, no matter how this turns out, is going to be legal in Vermont. But um, there's also a question of access. And we just had the clinic in the kingdom shut down. I'm wondering if you think there's anything more that the state can be doing to make sure that women can still access health care. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember uh, hearing about that in the initial stages. And, uh, and I questioned that with our team and back to uh, HS to make sure that we were doing everything we can uh, to provide those services, uh, particularly for the rural parts of the state. I mean, this is what we're seeing, and uh, that's why I, I feel as though this is the time uh, to make Vermont, again, grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, to protect the most vulnerable. And we need to do that in all parts of the state. And I'm, I'm very concerned about the rural uh, parts of our state. Uh, that's why we want to focus for economic package on revitalization of, uh, of some of those communities uh, that have been uh, left behind. 
uh, as I said in my opening remarks, the, the grand list has either been stagnant or receding in many half the communities in Vermont. That's, that's not a good sign. And uh, when you see uh, redrawing of the maps uh, from uh, representation, uh, legislative representation, uh, you can see it's more concentrated in the uh, more populous areas of the state, Chittenden County in particular. And what happens is you don't have the representation in the rural areas. And, uh, and I'm, again, very concerned about that. So we need to make sure that we're using this once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to take the, the $100 million that I've asked for and make sure that we inject that into those communities so they can take charge of their economy, grow, bring in more population so that we have uh, some of those facilities and are able to pay for them as well and protect all uh, 14 counties of the state. I hope you're not speaking out of turn here, but you seem to have some pretty big differences between your beliefs and some of the policy priorities of the National Republican Party. And I'm wondering if you can give us an insight to your internal feelings over that. You still have an R next to your name. Is, is there a kind of point of no return that you would rethink that? You know, there's, I think there's a, admittedly, uh, the moderate centrists um, ha are becoming further and further and fewer and fewer, regardless of the party, whether it's uh, Democrats or Republicans. Um, and when you look at the Northeast in particular, Governor Hogan, Governor Baker, uh, Governor Sununu, and so forth, I think we're more uh, moderate, more centrist uh, than, than others. Governor Manchin, our former Governor Manchin, now Senator Manchin, uh, has taken a, a lot of heat uh, for his moderate stance, his centrist stance. Um, and I think that's unfortunate I, because I think most Americans, I think, are more centered. Um, it's just that the, the way the, that our, our parties are made up, uh, particularly with primaries, um, I think it forces the candidates to go to the extremes, either the extreme left or the extreme right, which doesn't leave us much of a lane in the center for moderate centrist candidates. So again, I think uh, it's imperative uh, that we continue to, to find that lane and uh, that we elect more uh, centrists and moderates if we can work together uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, to bring us together as a country. Dr. Levine, um, I'd like to throw you a curveball in, in light of the SCOTUS news. Can you describe for Vermonters some of the healthcare implications for when women don't have access to safe and regulated abortions and some of the healthcare repercussions that can happen if they have unsafe ones. <clears throat> yeah, I think public health in general and certainly public health in Vermont has <clears throat> stood for access and reproductive rights. Um, I would hate to see our country, uh, women in our country, have to revert to practices of a historic era where <clears throat> things were done, <clears throat> excuse me, clandestinely and um, uh, in the dark, so to speak, often by the person themselves, um, and infection rates were astoundingly high, uh, hemorrhaging rates were astoundingly high. Um, it was a very, very challenging time. And access to a procedure that is a medical procedure that actually could be done safely and effectively uh, was viewed as a real advance. So I would just hate to see us revert to that era. Do you think practitioners in Vermont have the resources? Obviously, we have the laws in place to maintain uh, you know, legal abortions, but do they have the monetary and staffing requirements needed to be able to carry out and meet demand? Um, I can just answer very generally because I don't have any data with me at this time, but I'm not aware that <clears throat> access or uh, economic issues have really interfered with any woman's right uh, to be honored. Governor, I know you're uh, pondering whether or not you want to seek re-election and you're going to delay that decision for a while, but as you're thinking about all this stuff and 
considering your decision, does it ever occur to you that maybe you should run as an I and not an R? I think I've been successful uh, throughout my career running as an R, but being a moderate centrist. I mean, this has been um, something that, that I've done since the very beginning. Uh, I've reached across the aisle, uh, expecting people to reach back uh, to me as well, to work together. Uh, it's more difficult uh, being, and again, whether you're a moderate centrist Democrat or a moderate centrist Republican, it's equally as hard. Uh, as, we, as, again, Senator Manchin is finding out, um, it's easy uh, to go to the extremes, right? Extreme left, extreme right. Everyone knows where you're going to be and what your vote is going to be, and there's not much debate on where you're going to vote and how you're going to vote. But those in the center, those moderates and centrists of either party, um, have to contemplate uh, what, what it is that would be best for the state in, in this situation, are there constituents, and what's what you can live with. So. I've been successful in doing that uh, over the last 22 years. I don't plan to, to change. Um, I'm a Republican, but I'm a, I'm a fiscally responsible Republican, uh, but um, I'm you know, a social uh, moderate centrist. All right, we will move to the phones, starting with Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, uh, can you share with us the words that you uh, shared with the uh, folks uh, leaving to be uh, to Ukraine when you were over at the base? Yeah. Um, so we had a couple of uh, deployments. Uh, one was last Thursday night, and uh, I couldn't be more proud of uh, those members of the military, our National Guard members, uh, who uh, are off to defend, protect, train with our NATO allies in Europe. And uh, certainly, uh, I think it's important at this point in time uh, for us to take a stand and uh, to make sure that we have the backs of Ukraine uh, for those who are in this uh, battle that they didn't ask for um, to uh, to protect them and have their back in any way we can possibly. So, um, again, I think this is important uh, for our country, uh, but our state as well. I mean, we're amongst an elite group who was asked to send our F-35s over there. This is what we train for. Uh, this is what they train for and what they are, are prepared for. Um, so again, I um, confirmed with them uh, that uh, while they're there uh, protecting us, uh, protecting Europe, uh, protecting our way of life, uh, that we would be here to uh, protect their families and uh, to take that off their plate. And if they have any issues, if anyone here is listening who has a member of their family deployed and you need anything at all, call us and we'll do whatever we can to help you. We, that's the last thing your family members need to worry about when they're overseas. Thank you. Uh, I believe this is for Dr. Levine. Um, Dr. Levine, are you recommending that uh, backyard chicken owners and other people who have chickens, uh, if they wear PPE at this time? just out of precaution? No, that's not a recommendation at this time. Will you inform us when it is one? Sure, but I, I would hope we wouldn't be at that point. Absolutely. Uh, last thing, uh, this may be for Jason. Uh, I've noticed both, I've gotten a lot of readers who have emailed me and also comments on Facebook. I guess the audio on the Facebook is the live is not particularly good. So if there's anything you can do for those folks uh, viewing there, it'd be great. We've identified some equipment that we're going to be purchasing. <laughs> is we it see, in the budget? We see the comments too. Well, we'll, see, we'll see what happens over the next two or three weeks. Yeah. 
see if we have the budget to do that. Okay, thanks very much. No more questions. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, Governor, before I ask a question on Secretary Curley, just to be clear, um, maybe Bob Kendall knows something I don't, but when are you going to announce your decision to run or not run for governor? Sometime between uh, now, before the end of the session or by the end of the session, okay. whenever, whenever that is. <laughs> Uh, Secretary Curley, I'm wondering in your presentation, um, could you give us some uh, specifics about projects you're you're talking about in, in rural areas that would that would help uh, in particular towns or, or something like that, just so the the readers and the viewers will know what we're talking about. Absolutely. Um, so we do have Commissioner Goldstein on the line, and she probably has a, a list right in front of her and can probably help me out, but. Um, these are projects that really range from um, child care centers that that provide um, job growth, but you know specifically to the center, but more broadly job growth to an area um, that need some some funding to help get those over the finish line. We have a variety of um, different needs within municipalities, let's say, where it might be uh, wastewater upgrades. Um, that don't necessarily qualify through other programs that, again, we know will lead to uh, the kind of growth that we all agree on. Um, housing, to, to name one very important one. But Commissioner Goldstein, if you're on the line, um, are there a couple of projects that you could give a little bit um, more color to, to to help explain to folks what we're talking about? Sure. Thanks, Secretary Curley. I think uh, you've covered uh, a lot of it. Do people hear me OK? We can. I can't tell. Okay. Oh, a um, little louder, so, please. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Thanks. The um, the projects that sort of like two two tranches, if you will. One are projects that would qualify under the ARPA ruling, the the Treasury funds, and that would be, as Secretary Curley alluded to, the uh, child care centers, like production of more slots, will help everything will help the child care center, will help those parents returning to work. Also performing arts venues that had been uh, suffering so much since the uh, pandemic uh, for them to either make some adjustments to their physical space or to do expansions. Uh, we also have municipalities, small municipalities that may not have enough funding to do a full on extension of their infrastructure in order to accommodate either an economic development project, think about a business that needs to expand or a food processing facility that needs an upgrade, um, as well as any transportation improvements that need to occur in that municipality in order for that private development to occur. So it's a myriad of private sector, nonprofit sector, as well as municipal sector. I was just wondering if there's a, a municipality you should mention or not, or is it, is it, you haven't got to that point yet? There are some municipalities that have supported our project-based um, TIF initiative, uh, namely Westford and Montgomery, as some examples. And there are many rural towns that we probably don't even know of just yet, but really have not had development in the last decade. And so we don't want that to be, we don't want lack of infrastructure to be a, an impediment to creating the housing that we so sorely need. Uh, we need places for people to live. And so these small towns may not have the ability to come up with a full-fledged TIF district as an example. And so this will go a long way to trying to bridge that gap in funding that they would need in order to do that type of housing development or business development. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Uh, Governor, recognizing that Senator Mark McDonald and Common Sense agree that 715, the clean heat standard, is a de facto carbon tax, uh, will you be keeping your 2016 campaign promise to veto any carbon tax? Well, again, I've asked for this bill to come back to us um, so that it isn't just um, putting a rubber stamp on this initiative. So. I'd like to see what it's going to cost, what it's going, how it's going to affect us, and uh, and then be able to debate the issue 
uh, again in the next session. Oh, so it's, it's, but if it passes this year, uh, would you? I'm, I'm not support. Yeah. I, it, or would you be waiting until that? Again, I've said um, from my standpoint, it's got to come back for my support. It's got to come back to us and be put in bill form so that we can debate it and we know all the details and the funding and what it's going to cost us before we move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, also, have you reviewed Department of Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas' plan for a information governance board to suppress free speech in the United States? And do you have an opinion on that? I have not seen that um, and I can't imagine what that would mean. Um, I would want to, I guess, I, we need to support the Constitution, uh, protect free speech. If we're, if he is talking about trying to limit uh, the Russian bots and so forth uh, that are infiltrating our social media uh, with, uh, with fake news, so to speak, then I think that we should get involved. But free speech from Americans, uh, no, we need to protect that. Thank you. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Oh, my question has been, my question has been asked. Thank you. Aaron Patanko, VT Digger. My question was asked. Sorry, I couldn't unmute in time. Sorry to interrupt, Aaron. Thanks, oh, Chris. go ahead. Um, all right, can you hear me now? We can. Okay. Um, I uh, I had a question for Dr. Levine. Um, you said that you would ask Vermonters to strongly consider taking prevention steps such as wearing a mask. Would you say that you are recommending that Vermonters wear a mask? And is there a reason you're not using that terminology when you guys have used it in previous waves to describe what behaviors people should take in public? I think I was pretty clear that <clears throat> I'm asking Vermonters no matter what time frame they're in in the pandemic, to always be considering their own personal risk, their own personal risk tolerance, their own conditions, their own age, their own living circumstances, who they're with. And this would be a time with cases that are at higher levels than they've been previously with this variant to wear a mask and take other measures to protect themselves. Okay, so you're not necessarily recommending this for broader public consideration. Like, like we've said before, there are going to be many times that there are people that you come into contact with that are wearing masks and that are not wearing masks. And we need to be respectful and civil and understand that everyone has their reason at that point in time. I could see that there can be a fair number of people who may have had Omicron within the last two months. I'm not sure wearing a mask is going to benefit them or benefit the rest of us because they've already been through their infection, resolved their infection, and not had the need to wear a mask. There are others who are going to view uh, their activities to be very uh, circumscribed and not putting them into any high-risk situation. They may be younger and uh, not at high risk for any serious outcome, and they may feel it's not appropriate to wear a mask. Um, what we're saying at this point in time is this is the time that we really should take strong public health guidance, strong personal risk assessment, and not impose upon that any you know, major mandates or things from a uh, governmental level, because that's not where we're at in the pandemic at this point in time. Okay. Um, I also wanted to know what do you make of the latest breakthrough hospitalizations data, which shows that 
at least in this latest surge, um, vaccinated and unvaccinated Vermonters have very similar hospitalization rates. I wouldn't say it's exactly the same, but over the past couple of weeks, there have been multiple points where unvaccinated people had higher rates or they almost had the exact same rate of hospitalization. Um, yeah. Does that indicate to you that BA2 is harming or causing more severe cases in vaccinated people? That's a great question. So let, let's take a step back. Um, the term breakthrough, when that term broke through, I think was a very unfortunate time because it originally was used to characterize people who had been vaccinated who then became a case. And it totally distorted what the vaccines were all about, which were protecting people from serious outcomes which is what we've been doing with vaccines for a long time, specifically the most familiar one, the flu shot. Um, so I don't like the term breakthrough, but <clears throat> we'll have to use it since you, you brought it up. Um, with regard to hospitalizations now, at times showing that there are more people who've been vaccinated uh, in the hospital than are unvaccinated, there's several components to that. One component is, again, the words fully vaccinated are meaningless when it comes to all of the newest variants. You need to be up to date. And up to date doesn't mean fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated is you got the first series and you stop there. Up to date means when you were eligible for the first booster, you got the first booster. So that's one important criteria. The booster is what's protecting the majority of people from ending up in the hospital. <clears throat> the second thing is a, a mathematical exercise looking at numerators and denominators. <clears throat> There's very few people in Vermont these days, proportionately, that haven't been vaccinated. We have a majority of our population, a vast majority, that's been vaccinated, of those who are eligible. Obviously, we still have those under age five that are still waiting. So even if a vaccine is 90 plus percent effective at preventing hospitalization, if the entire state of Vermont is vaccinated, that's still a significant number of people that might fall in that 10% that didn't get the same benefit as the 90%, if I can simplify it that way. So we're dealing with larger numbers of people. So I would expect we will see some of those people in the hospital data. And there are times it may look disproportionate to those who are unvaccinated just because that pool of people is so small at this point in time. So if you look at it as what proportion of the unvaccinated are getting hospitalized versus what proportion of the vaccinated are getting hospitalized, you'll still see a significant benefit to being vaccinated. But if you just look at raw numbers in the hospital on any given day, you'll lose that perspective. Okay, thank you very much. And as an aside, we still keep track of those being uh, treated for COVID uh, in the hospitals and those that, who just happen to have COVID in the hospital and it's still running between 40 and 60 on any given day, one way or the other. Kevin McCallum, seven days. Thank you, Governor. Can you hear me okay? We can. My apologies if I uh, repeat some of the questions you've, you've already answered in some fashion. But I would like to ask you whether you participated in or voted in the Vermont uh, GOP's platform last week. They adopted a new platform, and I wondered if you voted in that or participated in any way. I did not. Okay. And I wonder how you feel based on what you've said so far about the part of that platform that says we value the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death. I wonder, and, and Wilson asked this question a different way, but I, I wonder if you could just speak to your alignment with that party given that it has uh, a position that differs from your own so significantly. Well, obviously we have a different point of view on that. Um, and I, uh, believe in a woman's right to choose and I believe in individual freedom to do what you want with your own body and 
and make those decisions on your own. So uh, we have a different viewpoint on that, and um, but that's the way uh, I have been uh, throughout my political career. Can you can you say why you don't participate in the Vermont Republican Party's uh, annual exercise in setting a platform? I think um, again, whether it's the uh, Republican Party or the Democrat Party. Um, most, I think, would agree uh, that it's the most extreme uh, members of the party who participate in that. Uh, the others, the, the centrists, the moderates, and so forth, uh, don't uh, because uh, they're overwhelmed and uh, um, the voices are fairly loud on the extremes. Uh, and again, that's in either party. So I don't think you see as much participation um, from the moderates and centrists. And so I choose uh, to, um, to continue to run as a Republican, um, but, uh, but I have not participated in the platform. Okay. And I have a question about the clean heat standard, and I know you've touched on it several times here today, but I just want to ask you, could you understand how someone who's a Vermonter who's deeply concerned about um, climate change and Vermont meeting its uh, climate obligations uh, might be concerned to see uh, your administration not supporting TCI and now having some concerns about the clean heat standard question your commitment to meeting those goals? Well, first of all, let's go back to TCI. Uh, we didn't oppose it. Uh, we had a seat at the table. We didn't join it. We wanted to see what, again. I mean, it, it makes the point of the clean heat standard. We wanted the details. We wanted to see if it'd be beneficial uh, to Vermont. Uh, we wanted to uh, to see what it was going to cost Vermonters, uh, and uh, before we joined, uh, it uh, it literally fell apart. I think Connecticut was the first who bailed out. Um, there were many other states who did afterwards. So uh, that wasn't our doing. Uh, we still had a seat at the table and were willing to listen, and wanted to just do what was best for Vermont and make sure that we got our fair share as well, and that was never proven to us. Uh, in terms of the clean heat standard, I'm saying move forward, um, but we want to see the details. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon any elected official uh, to know what they're voting on, and I don't think we know what we're voting on. Um, I would go back to, uh, as you might recall, uh, last year when uh, we received the billion uh, 200 um, billion a quarter of dollars from uh, the federal government uh, that uh, that I'd put forward a plan for between two and 250 million dollars uh, for climate change mitigation um, that wasn't uh, accepted uh, by uh, the legislative process at that point in time um, but uh, but I feel strongly uh, that we need to do our part in uh, in making sure that we uh, reduce our Reliance on on uh, carbon fuels, and uh, and we'll we put our money uh, where our mouth was in that regard. So, again, we can still do this, um, I, and I still believe uh, w when we get the details of the clean heat standard, that um, that uh, the legislature and and the executive branch will have uh, an opportunity to weigh in on that uh, when it does come back. But I think it's important that it comes back. Okay. And then the last question is, can you explain the general, uh, the grand list rather, stagnation in so many towns in Vermont in an era where home prices are soaring and have been for the last couple of years? What's the reason uh, that so many towns are struggling? Well, again, I think you'll see um, that uh, the inflationary values of real estate is uh, increasing certain parts of the state and not in others, not to the same rate. Uh, as well, you'll see a, a lot of uh, commercial properties that, that were in downtowns uh, that were once uh, uh, the economic centers of the of the area that are not anymore. Empty storefronts, uh, empty buildings. Uh, uh, go, go take a drive through uh, Springfield, and they've made some improvements over the last a number of years. Uh, but again, just a shadow of itself uh, when you when you look at what's happened. Even in my hometown of Barrie, I mean, there was, there was a time when uh, that was a vibrant economic center, uh, with Granite uh, being uh, the, the um, I guess, the nucleus of the economy. 
and that uh, that changed, and with it uh, changed the community, uh, the downtown, the uh, property values, and so forth. Uh, even the um, the population has declined uh, over the last 20 or 30 years by about 2,000 people, I believe. So, at that point in time, 30 years ago, I believe we were the third largest city in the state, and uh, nowhere near that at this point. So. I, I would say that the values are increasing in those population centers in the Northwest, um, but uh, half the communities uh, have their grand lists stagnant or receding. Secretary Curley, anything you want to add to that? Joan May, but. Joan, anything you want to add to that? Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, Kevin, we could, uh, we could send you the list that was, that was uh, calculated by tax department, you know, there is appreciation. Um, and what we try to do is isolate the towns that, um, you know, sort of separate and distinct from appreciation. We want to understand how much development is occurring in a town. And that's what we are referring to, the full list of value. And most of them are under 1% over the last 10 years. And that's what we're defining as stagnant or declining. So, you know, the less development that happens, the less uh, sort of properties we have to share in terms of the taxable base. And it, it's very different from, for example, looking at the appreciation that's occurred, because generally then the education tax will be equalized. But that doesn't really give you a sense that the housing supply has increased or that the amount of commercial property available for development has increased. And that's what we're after with this with this proposal, but we'd be happy to send you the data. That'd be great. Thank you. I appreciate it, both of you. Great. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? We can. Excellent. Uh, I'm very much interested in receiving that same list uh, about the town. Uh, <laughs> A grand list, so if that could be forwarded to me as well. Um, and sure. on that topic, uh, Kevin, I'm sure Kevin you'll see some in Caledonia Curry. County. Familiar uh, names. I'm, I'm guessing as much, yep. Yeah. Uh, what is the funding gap between the 100 million investment that you're calling for and where the legislature is now? Uh, and, and you've spoken about the opportunity and resources this would provide the rural parts of the state. Um, in that same vein, but from a slightly different angle, are there consequences uh, for the rural corners that you fear if the funding isn't provided? Yeah, I think we'll continue to see a stagnation in the rural parts of the state uh, that uh, will can, I mean, this is, if we keep doing the same thing over and over, we're gonna get the same results. And that's what's happened uh, to the rural areas of, of the state. And that's why we've been focused on them. Um, I believe at this point in time, we've, uh, we've communicated uh, to the legislature uh, that uh, we need another 40 million um, to, to uh, complete some of the projects and some of the programs that we have, um, have forwarded. So uh, that's the number, I believe, uh, that we're the gap that we see at this point in time. And we could always use more, uh, but that's the minimum. Okay, uh, and then um, switching subjects real briefly for uh, Commissioner uh, Levine. Um, curious if uh, if it's known how many of the self-reporting uh, positive results overlap with later confirmation tests, or if, if it's your understanding that the, the pool of positive results that, that you report on a weekly basis is distinct from the, from the daily case count. So you're talking about the self-reported results first? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So are, are those unique and distinct from, or is there a chance that a good chunk of those uh, end up getting confirmatory tests and show up in the daily case? Count? Yeah. So my impression, and I would hope this is true actually, is that the majority of the self-report tests are home antigen tests. And that would be the positive result because it's an accurate result at a time when disease prevalence is high. <clears throat> None of those people should really require a PCR to confirm it. Some of those self-reported tests could be 
the take-home lamp test, which is an equivalent to a PCR, but that's going to be the minority. So we don't really have a way of correlating self-report results. I will say that this week, one of the things that gave me that little hint of optimism I expressed earlier is that <clears throat> the number of self-reported tests did come down a little from its peak uh, by a slight amount. We're talking still 1,600 self-reported tests. Um, and out of those, 1,155 were positive and 450 were negative. But <clears throat> we'll see if that trend continues because if people are testing a little less often, it probably means that less symptomatic people out there. Do you have any, um, any data on how many cases are repeat cases? How many Vermonters have had COVID more than once now? Yeah, we do. Um, it's, if you look from the very, very beginning, I think we're talking in the 100 range. If, but if you look at Omicron, if you had a positive Delta test and then you got Omicron, we just put out a report with the CDC that there were five cases in Vermont and we pooled our five with a total of 10 around the country, three other states plus Vermont. So it's not a frequent event, but it is possible. And then uh, finally, uh, any uh, notion of how prevalent long COVID cases are amongst Vermonters at this yeah, point. Yeah, I, I really wish I had a number for you there, but we don't as of this point. Um, we are conducting our own study to try to determine that, but you know, to become long COVID takes several months of still having symptoms. So when we talk about you know people in the most recent highest surge which would be Omicron, uh, that's still being determined because that began, you know, right around the beginning of the year. And we just uh, entered the month of May. So it's going to be hard to say. <clears throat> There's a little sentiment around the country that um, you may have less of a chance of getting uh, long COVID if you've been vaccinated, but it's by no means a guarantee, but there's a reduction in the likelihood. I'd like that to be verified as true. That would be uh, certainly encouraging for all of us to hear. Okay, thank you all. Okay, thank you all very much and uh, we'll see you again next Tuesday.